So how producers and consumers are actually made better off um, through the market process and through like reaching competitive equilibrium. Oh, there you go, Ben. See, that's a spirit. Yeah, those points save me. After that, we'll look at the competitive, the efficiency of competitive markets. So, taking the ideas of consumer producer surplus and seeing how firms in equilibrium, or when a market's in equilibrium, how that's efficient. Then we'll look at different government interventions in the market. So, things the government does that distorts equilibrium, moves an economy out of equilibrium. So, things like price floors, price ceilings, and um, I think that's the section where we're going to talk about um, the war on drugs. The actual prohibition of using purchasing or using products. So we'll see what the effects of price floors, price ceilings, and a prohibition are. And then we'll look at the economic effect of taxes, how taxes distort um, a market in equilibrium. <clears throat> so in equilibrium, There's our market in equilibrium. The quantity supplied right here is going to equal the quantity demanded. So all the consumers that want to buy goods, and all the sellers that want to sell goods at that equilibrium price are going to be able to buy and sell. So we don't have any left over. We're at like that's you know, that's the goal. Um, so we talked about a little bit about how supply curves are a firm's marginal cost curve. So we're going to explore what the supply and demand curves are a little bit more before we get into consumer and producer surplus. So for example, and now we're going to start, I'll put some um, dollar values and quantities, like values up here, so we, the example makes a little bit more sense. So let's say right here, where the firm is producing, there's um, four units. And the value, the price here, is $10. So the idea is that the marginal cost of the fourth unit, the cost to produce that fourth unit, is going to be $10. So at the price of, if the firm can get $10 or more for it, they're going to bring that good to the market. If they can't get $10, if they can only get $9 back for it, they won't because they're going to be losing money. And right here, for the fifth unit, the value is eleven dollars, or the price of eleven dollars. So that means if they sell this this fourth unit right here, if they produce five units and they get eleven dollars back for it, <clears throat> this fourth unit it only costs them ten dollars to make. But if they're selling, say the demand curve runs through here at eleven dollars, they'll be selling all those units for eleven dollars. So on this fourth unit, they'll be making a one dollar profit. In essence, this is their producer surplus. This is what they're getting because the cost is lower than what they're actually getting back for it. They're being made better off by, by producing and selling at that price. So now, if we trace up from quantity up here to the, the uh, demand curve, we're going to get where consumers value a good. So we can think of this as the number of units being sold, but for this example, we can think of it as different consumers. So this is the fourth consumer, this is the fifth consumer of this particular product. So this price up here where it crosses the demand curve, that's the highest price that these consumers are going to be willing to spend on this good or service. It's going to be how much they value the good. And let's say, for instance, we have 85 bucks for consumer number four and 84 bucks for consumer number five. So that's, these prices are how much they value the goods, so the most they're willing to pay for it. And the reason these two consumers have different values is that subjective theory of value. So this is something that we're going to um, keep talking about all the time, but this is going to be in the background of what we're doing. So why the demand curve is downward sloping is because of the subjective value. So. Remember, the cost of a good isn't so much the money that you're giving up to pay for it, that you're actually like taking out of your pocket and spending on it. 
it's what that money can buy. So it's the other goods and services that money can buy for you. So really the cost of the good is the opportunity cost. The other alternative goods you could be buying with that money. So because of that, and because people have different uh, needs and they have different wants, different preferences, we end up with people having different values for goods. So all the way along this demand curve, you've got all these different people that value the good differently. Let's say consumer number 1,000 down here. They only value the good at $11. If the equilibrium price is way up here, let's call it 35 bucks. Equilibrium price up here, so that's where it's being sold in the market. This consumer down here that only values it for or for $11, they're not going to be able to purchase the market. It's not going to be worth it for them. Think of when you've seen like a product down the store and you're like, say it's like 50 bucks, and you're like, I'm going to pay more than like 20 for that. It's the same basic thing. You still have some value in that good, but because it's far lower than what it's actually being sold at, you're not going to buy it. But there's other people that do value it higher. These people up here that really want or need that product for some reason, they're going to be willing to pay those high prices. So the, the market's in equilibrium, and the price is here at $35. There's a lot of people up here that are willing to pay a lot more than they're actually forced to pay. So these people are being made a lot better off. So they're getting a lot of additional value. Not only are they getting a good they value at $85 bucks for this consumer number four, but they're also, in essence, getting like $53 because that's money they're willing to spend on it, but they're not being forced to spend on it. So they're getting made you know, a lot better off than just getting that good. Um, that $35, what they could spend it on, brings the other things they'd spend it on would bring them a lot less value, a lot less enjoyment or utility um, than that good they're buying. Likewise, firms are pretty, all these units down here lower on the supply curve, cost a lot less than $35 to produce. So firms are making a profit on all these. So when a market's in equilibrium, what we end up with is basically above this price up here, all that is value being created for consumers. Consumers are being made better off by even more than they're spending. So this person right here, IQ star, let's say it's um, consumer number 250. Right there, there, they value that $35 and that product equally. Everyone above this values the good for more than $35, and they're only spending $35. So they're all being made better off. Likewise, this area right here, below the price they're being sold at, but above the cost of production, that right there is profit for firms. So that's the money firms are actually making above the cost of producing these goods. So we have a, a market in equilibrium. Both consumers and producers are being made better off. They're not just trading straight up and being, being left the same. They're trading $35 for a good that's worth $35. They're trading $35 for a good that costs less than $35 to make, but they value more than $35. So instead of just rearranging what we have, in theory, it's like we're, um, through trade, we're creating more in an economy because we're making people better and better off. So yeah, so a lot of that I ended up, on this side I ended up covering. Um, some consumers, like I said, are willing to pay more than what the actual equilibrium value is. So they're getting more value from that good than the price that they're paying. Because of voluntary exchange, both parties, they don't have to engage in these transactions. They choose to engage in these transactions when it's beneficial for them, when they know they'll make themselves better off. Because of this, we would expect um, people to have more value from these trades, that they're giving up, in their minds, less than they're getting. So back when we used to be able to go in public, my example was a Friday night Uber. When it's 2 a.m. and you're standing on a street corner in like a different city, say you've gone to visit Philly for the weekend, um, 
being forced to walk home 2 a.m. in a place you don't know, say a couple miles. Um, often you're willing to spend a lot more than what you're actually being charged. Because, you know, walking in the dark in a city you don't know, really late at night, really sucks. Um, I think when I did this slide last year, I, was, I had just like gone to DC to see some friends. And it was like the same thing. I was staying in Arlington and we went out in DC. So that's, well, like a three hour walk. Oh no. Not from the scooters. They didn't really have a lot of scooters back then. I mean, maybe like. Now, now they're like everywhere. Okay, so Disney Plus. Any anyone here at Disney Plus? Do you actually pay for or you like use your friends login? Friends. Um, so how much you guys be willing to pay for? Probably that's not good enough, but you know. They take my money. So they did a survey last year asking people, um, how much you'd be willing to pay for Disney Plus? And at the time, it cost six ninety nine. dollars Now, more than 25% of consumers, and I assume this is consumers in general, not people that use Disney Plus, but I, I'm not gonna lie, I don't remember at this point. And so more than a quarter of them were willing to pay more than $10 a month, even though Disney Plus only costs $7 a month. So they got so much value from Disney Plus that they'd be willing to pay even more money. That's just an example of consumer surplus, of these 25% of consumers valuing it at more than $3 per month of what they're being charged. And then almost 70% of consumers in like target age range indicate a willingness to pay something for the streaming service. Obviously talk is cheap, doesn't cost you anything. When someone calls you, say, hey, would you pay for Disney Plus? to say, oh yeah, I'd like that. I'd, I'd pay at least something. But this is showing there's a lot of people on this demand curve. Now I'm sure some of them are down here and they think the price is too high so they're not paying for it. Or cheap bastards like a few of us that are just gonna use our friend's login. My friend gave me his login, but he put it on my phone instead of like telling me what it was. So now I can only watch it on my phone. <laughs> he's like, he's like, man, I don't, I don't want like too many devices like you. And I'm like, right, why didn't you just like tell me I could put on one device from your phone to like a TV or device? Amazon Fire Stick, whatever. Can you do it through a Fire Stick? But yeah, you can. You can stream. I mean, you got the Xbox, man. I don't have an Xbox. Then you need a password and an account to get a Fire Stick. Yeah, who's being super weird enough? I don't know. Well, I was trying to watch a Mandalorian on my phone. It's, just, it's not the same. No, it's not. So you walk into a store and you see a Blu-ray of Star Wars The Force Awakens. And there's no price tag on it. Usually you walk in, you see the like, price is clearly listed. So it's, it's not like you think, like, is this worth it or not? But if you see, you walk in, you see a good with no price tag on it. A little bit different thought going through your head. Then you do a little bit more. Okay, so what do I actually value this at? What would I be willing to pay for it? So you go through your mind. Maybe you think maybe you really like Star Wars, but you don't have that yet. So you're like, oh yeah, I'll pay like 30, 40 bucks for it. Or maybe you don't like Star Wars. So I don't know, maybe, maybe five bucks. Any more than that, it wouldn't be worth it for you. So you walk in the register, you find out it costs 25 bucks. If you value more, then you're excited. You're like, hey, I was willing to pay 40 bucks for this. Not only to pay twenty five, so it's like fifteen dollars worth of value you're getting for free. If it's five bucks, or if you value five dollars and it costs twenty five bucks, then you're like hell with that. You like you know one of those people like throw it down on the register. You can pile up of like like random stuff there. So for you, it's not worth it. Like you, I'll get five dollars worth of enjoyment out of this. So we use the idea of surplus to refer to the benefit that people get from engaging in market transactions. So on the consumer side, 
That's going to be the difference between the highest price you're willing to pay and um, the actual price that you're going to pay. So if you're this consumer over here, you value $85 and you're being charged 35 bucks. That's $50 worth of value you're getting. That's your consumer surplus. Producer surplus is the difference between the lowest price a firm is willing to accept for a good or service and the price it actually receives. So in this case, basically the marginal cost. So marginal cost on unit four in this market is $10. So that's the lowest price they're gonna be willing to accept for it. So anything above that, in this case, price is 35, so they get 25 bucks above that, that's gonna be their producer surplus. And for a market in equilibrium, we're going to see both consumers and producers earning the surplus. They both get this additional value from engaging these transactions. So let's look and use a very simple demand curve for a market with four consumers. So we got these four consumers looking for buying a cup of chai tea. So we've got Teresa right here. Her willingness to pay is six dollars. The most she'll pay for a cup of tea is six dollars. Tom is willing to buy one for five dollars, Terry for four, and Tim only for three. Out of these four, Tim likes chai tea the least. So we can draw a very simple demand curve, and instead of having a uh, like a straight line, it's gonna be like steps because we literally only have four people here. So we draw them basically the demand curve being their willingness to pay. So here, Teresa at six dollars, Tom at five, Terry four, Tim at three. And then quantity going up from zero sold to four sold. So if the price of tea was six dollars, only Teresa would be willing to buy tea. So there's only going to be one sold in this market. And because that's exactly how much Teresa values it for, there's going to be zero consumer surplus. So how much the um, value the tea consumers get from this market is going to depend on the marginal benefit. So the additional benefit to a consumer for consuming that one extra unit of a good or service. In this case, for consuming one additional cup of tea. So if the price is low, many of them are going to benefit. And the price is high, a lot fewer are going to benefit. So the price is down here like $3, they're all going to buy it. So they're all going to get benefit from this. Whereas if it's at $6, only Teresa is going to get any sort of benefit. So if the price is $3.50 a cup, what's going to happen? In this case, everyone whose value is above that $3.50 is going to be willing to buy one of these cups. So it'll be Teresa, oh, I forget who else's name. So, okay, Teresa, Tom, and Terry. So Teresa's willing to buy for $6. She's being charged $3.50. So the consumer surplus she's getting is going to be the difference between the two. So 6 minus three fifty is two fifty. So she's getting $2.50 of additional benefit that she's not having to pay for in this case. Well, if you want to look at it like using geometry, the area of the rectangle A, so from zero to one unit and the 350 to six, that's going to be um, Teresa's consumer surplus as well. So Tom and Terry, they also have consumer surpluses, although they're not as high. Tom values the uh, cup of tea at five dollars. He only has to pay three fifty. So for him, the difference is a buck fifty. And then for Terry, he values it at four dollars. He gets fifty cents above the three dollars and fifty cent price. So with pretending these four are an entire market. Um, when school is in session, that's probably the size of the, the tea market in Loretto. Anyway, um, the consumer surplus is A, B, and C. So the difference between the price being sold at and then like the top of that demand curve.
Okay, so in this case, for that. So the total consumer surplus in the market, I didn't add that up. So we have what? 250 for Teresa, 150 for Tom, and 50 cents for Terry. So we end up with uh, $4.50. So that's the entire consumer surplus in this market. Now let's say the price drops to $3. In this case, Tom, Teresa, and Terry each get an additional 50 cents of consumer surplus. So this price drop of 50 cents, they each get that as part of their consumer surplus. Because now that's 50 cents less a piece that they have to pay for tea. In this case, Tim, who values it at $3 and now is being charged $3, isn't different between buying the cup of coffee or cup of tea or not. Either way, he's gonna have the same amount of utility or enjoyment from this, because he values the money equally to the tea. So the overall consumer surplus in this market is still the area below the demand curve, and it is, now it's above the new price the new market price, which is now only $3. So in this case, it's going to increase from $4.50 to $6. That's like a total consumer surplus in this mini market. Obviously, the market for chai tea is a lot larger than just four consumers, like in this example. So when there's many consumers, the market demand is going to look normal like this. It's going to be flat and downward slope. It's not going to be like the step stool like before. So we can consider consumer surplus the area below the demand curve and above the price. So that little triangle. So the price in this example is two dollars for a cup of uh, chai tea. There's fifteen hundred or fifteen thousand um, cups being drank per day by consumers. So the total market, the uh, consumer surplus in this market is going to be the area of this triangle. Okay, so let's look at a quick example. So, obviously, having access to like decent internet is beneficial for consumers. People enjoy that. Um, it's how we get a lot of our entertainment now. But we can also measure how beneficial it is if we can um, estimate the consumer surplus that's derived in this market for internet. So, in order to do this. We need to know the demand curve for broadband internet service and the price of broadband internet service. The price is very easy to figure out. Um, it's usually advertised by internet providers. But demand curve can be a lot trickier to try to estimate. So a pair of economists a few years ago tried to estimate the demand curve for internet service. Um, Back in 2006, the average price for broadband internet service was 36 a month. The price here at 36. And we had 47 million subscribers per month. That's the quantity demanded. So they estimated a demand curve and ended up going, so where zero consumers purchase internet was at $73.89 a month. So this whole triangle right here the consumer surplus. So to calculate that, they literally just took the area of that triangle, area of the triangle being a half times the base times the height. So they have the 47 million, the length right here. And then the height is 7389 minus the 36, times it by a half and they end up with $890.4 million per month. So according to their estimations, every month, just from having internet in, I believe this was for the entire United States, now 47 million, I don't know how many households there. So yeah, we'll say for the entire United States, um, per month, the consumer surplus, so the extra value we got from the internet without having to pay for it, so above what we paid for it, was $890.4 million each month. So this is all the additional value that's being created that consumers get to enjoy without having to pay for it. Obviously this consumer, consumer number 
47 million right there valued their internet right at $36. So they're getting no consumer surplus from it. But everyone else, everyone here to the left, is getting some additional value from the internet. All right, do you guys have any questions for we covered so far? Okay, uh, let's take a break because we've been talking for a while. You guys have random questions? Debate to start, I don't know, whatever. Is the average school in the Yes. It was. I think mean, 84% and change, 84.3. So, not terrible. I think that's right about, you want to be in the mid to upper 80s, like the average for a class. It was a pretty big class. So let's look at how elasticity relates to consumer surplus. So how elastic the demand is for a good impacts how much consumer surplus that consumers receive from a good. So we'll look at two different products. We'll look at Fight Milk and Wolf Cola. So Fight Milk is a small fan base and they're very sensitive to price because there's a lot of alternative supplements they could be using. So there's a lot of other products that fill the need that Fight Milk fills. On the other hand, Wolf Cola has, let's say, a distinctive taste, and they're in many markets. Um, they're one of the few cola options available. So there's a much less elastic demand. Consumers are a lot less sensitive to price for Wolf Cola than they are for Fight Milk. So left here we have Fight Milk, very inelastic, or excuse me, elastic demand. So a small change in price is going to lead to a much larger change in the quality demanded. What we end up here is a much smaller area for consumer surplus. Because they're more sensitive to price, they're not going to be willing to pay a high price. Uh, the consumers that value the most on this high end aren't that much higher than the equilibrium price. So there's not going to be a ton of consumer surplus in this market. For, here for Wolf Cola, we have relatively inelastic demand. So they're not very sensitive to price. So if there's a, these consumers on the high end that value it greatly, are going to be way up here, way above the equilibrium price. So when demand is more elastic, there's going to be a much larger consumer surplus. There's a lot of consumers that are willing to pay a lot more than they're paying at equilibrium. So when elasticity is high, consumer surplus is low. Consumers don't value the good for a lot more than it's being sold for in equilibrium. And they're going to be a lot more sensitive to any price change because of that. On the other hand, if elasticity is low, the demand for good is inelastic, consumer surplus is going to be a lot higher. Again, they, a lot of consumers are valuing the good for much more than it's being sold for in equilibrium. And people aren't going to be very sensitive to price. So if there's a price change, they're not going to um, change the quantity demanded very much. So now let's look at the other side of the market, like the producer surplus. So kind of like how um, a lot of things from demand carried over for supply, a lot of things for producer surplus carry over are very similar to what's going on in, um, with consumer surplus. So producer surplus is the difference between the lowest price that a firm will accept for a good or service and the price it actually receives. So this lowest price they're going to be willing to accept is the marginal cost of producing that good or service. Again, remember, firms don't want to lose money. So if they can't make the money back on that product, they're not going to be willing to sell. So that marginal cost is going to be the lowest they'll, they'll accept for a good or service. So the um, 
producer surplus is going to be a difference between the price they actually receive and the lowest they're willing to charge. So let's go back to this um, chai tea market. So for the first cup of tea, it costs Ebony Tea, this tea producer, a dollar twenty-five to make. For the next unit, it's going to cost them a buck fifty to make, then a buck seventy-five to make, and finally the fourth unit will cost two dollars and twenty-five cents to make. So again, we have this. This is a supply curve, and just like the demand curve, it's pink because there's only four units to be sold. But in that larger market, it includes like everyone is going to be like a straight line again. Let's say the market price of tea is two dollars. In this case, for that first unit, they'll get seventy-five cents of producer surplus. So the difference between that two dollars and the buck twenty-five the cost to make it. The second unit, which costs about fifty to make, will have fifty cents of producer surplus. But the difference between that two dollars and the buck fifty. And then their third cup, they'll have twenty-five cents of producer surplus. So a buck seven, or two dollars minus buck seventy-five. So twenty-five cents. Now this last unit, this fourth unit, costs $2.25 to make. That's more than the $2 price they're receiving, so a firm isn't going to choose to produce that last unit. So they'll end up producing three units, and with the um, with a producer surplus of $1.50. So the total area, you add up A, B, and C, $0.75, cents, $0.50, cents, $0.25, cents, you end up with $1.50. So that's their producer surplus. <coughs> So just like before, the total amount of producer surplus, we can get the area um, relative to the price. So we go below the price and above the supply curve. Again, because we're looking at the entire market, so there's 15,000 cups being sold per day, we end up with that straight and flat supply curve that we had before, not, the, not like the steps going up to the super small market. So the consumer or producer surplus is going to be the area. So it will be of this 15,000 times almost two dollars times a half. That would be that that's the area to get the producer surplus. Um, a lot of times students trip up and they mark this as a producer surplus while it's like because of geometry they'll well if the supply curve is zero, they'll be equal to each other, but in this case, they're not going to be equal to each other. But anyway, this is not the producer surplus. Remember, it's right here, right underneath the consumer surplus. Okay, so consumer surplus, like I said, measures uh, the net benefit to consumers from participating in market. It's the net benefit, not the total benefit. So it's equal to the total benefit received by consumers. So, you know, $85, $84, like all these people along the demand curve. That's their total benefit. And then minus the total amount they have to pay. So it's $35. So that's why it ends up being just this area, not this whole area under the demand curve. So rather than being like the total benefit, again, it's the total benefit minus the cost. So that ends up being the net, about the net benefit. On the other hand, um, producer surplus measures the net benefit received by producers from participating in the market, from actually selling the goods or services they're providing. So it's equal to the total amount that firms receive from consumers minus the cost of producing that good or service. So it's not just the revenue they're getting from consumers buying their products, you also have to subtract out the cost of producing that good or service. And again, that's why it's just this area right here and not including anything under there because it's minus the cost of producing all those goods. <clears throat> all right. We've got five minutes left to class. Not worth it if we get a new section. Uh, so you guys take it easy. Have a good weekend.